from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. Tonight, we're very pleased to, presenting to, the, to be presenting the first of two concerts featuring musicians from Marlboro. And as you'll hear in our conversation, the Marlboro Festival and its extraordinary musicians are very much a part of our concert history here at the Library of Congress. With these two concerts, we're celebrating the 65th anniversary of the festival, founded in 1951 by legendary artists presented here in the Coolidge many, many times in the past century. Adolf Bush and his brother Herman Bush, Rudolf Serkin, Marcel Moise, and his wife Blanche Honegger Moise, and their son Louis. And I'd like to introduce three wonderful artists who are continuing the Marlboro tradition. Cellist Marcy Rosen, who's appeared here a number of times, and violinist David McCarroll and Emily Ann Gendron. Also with us is a good friend and colleague, Michael Wilpers, who is a performing arts programmer for the Bill and Mary Meyer concert series at the Smithsonian's Freer and Sackler Galleries. We were really delighted that Michael had been very interested with us in the idea of a joint presentation for the Marlboro concerts this season, which has a particular resonance for our 90th anniversary. We had the idea to join forces for this very informal talk, um, inspired by all the warm relationships that grew out of the founding artists' friendships and connections. And we'd like to talk about how so many Marlboro influences have helped to shape the practice and the performance of chamber music over the past six and a half decades. In fact, the story of Marlboro is really the story of chamber music in America, something the library and the Freer both have a long perspective on. And both our organizations have been a part of that story since its beginning. The first concert sponsored here in Washington by our founder, Elizabeth Spray Coolidge, were presented at the Freer in February 1924. Before we look at some of this history, including the American debut by Sirkin and Bush here in 1933, we wanted to talk with the artists and set the scene a little bit about the current Marlboro life and uh, talk about your experience. Michael, you had a question on this for them. Well, one of the things, uh, I had a chance to visit Marlboro finally uh, a couple summers ago and uh, discovered that uh, for me it felt so much more like a retreat uh, than a festival in the conventional sense because it's uh, so far away uh, out in the mountains and the woods. Uh, and it, what came to life for me were quotes I had already read on the anniversaries of Marlboro by so many of the artists was the unique opportunity for some of the young artists not knowing how unique it was to spend very extended lengths of time on individual pieces in rehearsal. Uh, there's a uh, often uh, uh, reiterated uh, quote in some of the literature by a young artist who went to Marlboro and thought, uh, I've made the right career decision, this is wonderful, we get to work on pieces for weeks and weeks and then perform them in public only when they're perfect. And uh, <clears throat> only after leaving Marlboro and then finally launching onto a, more, uh, a music career, getting invited to a symphony orchestra to play a concerto, found out he gets one rehearsal, and then we go on stage. And this was a, somewhat of a crushing disappointment and a slap of reality, uh, but it's uh, everyone at Marlboro speaks about uh, the, uh, the richness in interpretation and insight into a piece, shared insight and perfection of a piece through all the time that's spent together on them. So I was hoping that uh, each of you might reflect on some of the ways in which that much time on a piece with such great musicians has created memorable insights and routinely gives you a much, much deeper uh, knowledge and awareness of a piece. Uh, well, I guess I'll start. First of all, nothing's ever perfect. <laughs> um, but we do have an incredible luxury of time uh, to spend there and through when you, and I have a saying that I like to, to say, which is that when you learn something at Marlboro, you know it for your lifetime. And, and that's true of any piece that I worked on there as a, as a student, um, starting back many years ago. And, and the things then, the pieces that I've explored 
in the time that I've come back and been one of the old people, um, <laughs> it's been really incredible. David and I have spent a lot of time together. Um, there we had the luxury of working on uh, two of Beethoven's late quartets, the Opus 130 with the Fugue, and then the next summer we did Opus 131, and we spent seven weeks on each of those pieces, and we had an incredible time exploring that and learning that and being inspired not just by our own work with it, but by uh, input that we got from other people that were at the festival, like Michael Tree and Arnold Steinhardt, and so we had great lessons with those people. Um, and I think that the, the idea of sharing ideas is what Marlboro is really about, also learning how to vocalize your own ideas. And I think that's really the main gift that we're given at, at, uh, at the festival. And so it's, it is called a festival, it's, it is a retreat. Um, we all live together, we all eat together, we all get crazy together, um, and we all get really grumpy together, too. <laughs> So everybody, you have to learn to live with the moods and you and live in close, close quarters. And now we have the outlets of computers and cell phones, which when I was there as a kid, we didn't have that. There was one pay phone in each dorm. And remember, we used to write letters. Remember how we used to write letters? <laughs> <laughs> Such a luxury. That's also something that we don't do anymore. But um, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to, to be nurtured in a musical way. Um, Marcy said everything so beautifully, it's hard to add, but one thing I would add is just the, the place itself. The nature, I think, is very important to it, that it's not, um, you don't realize the hectic pace of life that you know is going on, you know, for seven weeks at the same time, but you're just so far away from that. Um, and that, you know, I often think about this, that life is sort of getting a you know, faster and faster pace, almost uncontrollably so, and it's just... Uh, obviously, when it was founded 65 years ago, it prob probably, you know, Serkin could never he even imagine uh, how how valuable it is today to have seven weeks just away from everything, just to focus on music. Um, you don't even have to worry about food or anything. You you know, you get up in the morning, you walk to rehearsal, you have have meals with your colleagues and friends, and then you go back to rehearsing, and this just happens over and over for seven weeks. And so inevitably something special comes out of that, that process. Uh, yeah, I mean, all these things um, I, I fully agree with. And um, yeah, the only th thing I guess I could add is, um, well, I guess a couple things. First of all, uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, the, the hypothetical case of the young person who has the slap in the face of reality, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, after having spent such luxury of time of working on pieces, and I, it's funny, I, I think about that because um, my experience coming to Marlboro was actually kind of the opposite of that because um, I was sort of, well, my my time at Marlboro was spent like in my, my late 20s basically, so I'd already sort of been out of school and, and you know, working and, and doing concerts and, you know, I. I by the time I, I was at Marlboro, like in my daily life during the year, I knew pretty well how to put something together pretty quickly and to, you know, create the illusion <laughs> that I knew it as well as I possibly did. But, um, but it was actually kind of an enlightening and completely shattering experience for me to have these years, these summers at Marlboro where I didn't have to feel that, like I was constantly under the gun of having to you know, put something together really quickly and just sort of like make the product. Um, it, it wasn't about that. It was really just about the exchange of these ideas and how to vocalize them, as Marcy said. And, and you know, it, yeah, the luxury of time, it really taught me something about what it means to approach um, music, just not, not just as a vocation, but as a thinking musician who, you know, lives these pieces time and time again. And that's actually one of the big privileges of, of having pieces selected uh, for these musicians from Marlboro Tours that, you know, we had the luxury of spending such time on them, uh, so much time, uh, you know, in a past summer. And then we have time away from it for, you know, well, in this case, like two years. And then we came back to it. And the insights and the things, at least for myself, that I, that I, that came forth, um, when I sort of studied it a second time, uh, you know, 
that was also in, like very eye-opening to just have yeah the luxury of time but then also time away from it <laughs> and then um I'm, I'm speaking specifically about the Penderecki piece, which um, will be featured tonight. The, the tours are always um, set up around <clears throat> a work that gets what supposedly is an extraordinary performance <laughs> at, the, at the festival. So we don't like to think that we do things that on that level all the time. But so we, we did a nice performance of the Penderecki um, at, at Marlboro, and Mr. Penderecki was there, and we worked with him. Um, and it's a, actually a really incredibly wonderful piece, which I know you'll enjoy. It's very atmospheric, very, uh, well, you, Emily describes it very well. She'll, she'll talk about that later. But it's a really beautiful and very accessible piece um, with gorgeous textures and colors. So uh, it's, it's moving. And I think the, the program that we built around it also enhances that. So the, programs, uh, the program fits together in a really lovely way. With Actually, none of the pieces ends with a big, loud chord. Everything, everything ends softly. So that's, that's something actually very, I actually really like. It requires a different attention and a different reaction from, from all of you. <laughs> well, if I could uh, follow up with one more question about the experience at Marlboro. Uh, one thing you learn when you're visiting there, spending time there, is a uh, egalitarian uh, philosophy. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, words I used when I was there that I learned quickly not to use, and I wish I could remember what they were. <laughs> it might have been, you know, master musician and student, or faculty and students, or words like that. But those are uh, really, you leave them at the door. Uh, maybe senior artists is used? We're, yeah, we're called senior members. Senior but, members, but, yeah. Um, but I was gonna, what it, I was gonna get to is, yeah. when you're rehearsing, you know, we've probably, many of us have probably seen master classes where there's no question, in fact, it's the whole point, that the master is uh, putting the, the uh, student uh, in their place in, many, in a lot of, uh, often enough. But I wonder if in these long, long weeks of rehearsal, how you uh, negotiate between the musicians who've been around and played the piece for decades and young musicians coming in who are extremely talented but don't have that depth of experience. And yet, the ideal is you share reflections and input equally. So I, I just wonder if you could tell a few anecdotes or, or make some generalities about how that plays out over the weeks. Well, I think it's, I mean, I'll speak, I can only speak for myself, but I think it's different with each senior. I, the, the, you know, everybody runs their groups a little differently. And I can tell you in, in the years that I was there with, with what, people that I consider my mentors, I pretty much did everything they told me to do. <laughs> and, um, and I really learned from that, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to hear Felix Gallimer tell me what to do, and I wanted to take in his, I wanted to soak it up. And, and, and in fact, the soaking up of the knowledge and the, the education that I had from Felix Gallimer and Philip Nagley and Pina Carmarelli and Mieczysław Horzhovsky and Rudolf Serkin and Sasha Schneider and Misha Schneider and all of these, you know, the list is humongous and I was privileged to get to work with them. That's the whole reason I went back was because I felt I wanted to pass their, I didn't want their knowledge to die. I wanted to pass it, pass it on and so I'm like the next step to keeping some of those traditions alive and I want those traditions to be carried on. And so I try to, I don't teach in these things, but you know, I think just that, just sometimes I'll say something that will inspire people or the idea will come out in a good way. And um, that's all it's doing. I think we're just all working together. But believe me, it's, it's um, a privilege for me to work with Emily and David and Danny and Anthony, who I also knew when he was <laughs> much younger, and um, it keeps you on your toes. I mean, I have to play my best to play with these guys, and um, it's, it's really a, a privilege. So. I think another thing that you guys always touch on is the Marlboro tradition of being faithful to the work itself. 
And I was reading to reading about Serkin, um, be learning this from Schoenberg. He was uh, involved with Schoenberg's Society for uh, Private Music in Vienna, but they had a very close affinity for study of the text. Um, and maybe this is a, we could segue and look at a couple of items here, um, see if our PowerPoint works. Um, Serkin was, uh, was 17 when he met Adolf Busch and later married his uh, daughter, Irene, uh, that's correct. Irina. Irena. And um, they came to the United States very early in, uh, our association was in 1933, but let's see if we can pull up just a quick bunch of images and we'll flip through them and then we have a picture of the first program. Oh, we already have this one on there, okay, great. Well, these are the founders. Um, this photo shows uh, one unidentified man, but there's uh, Moise, the woodwind guru, flutist, and uh, these are, as you say, these were artists who knew many of the composers. Um, Moise, for example, knew Ibert, and um, a lot of famous artists. Felix Gallimere played with Ravel, and you know, this, this lore, uh, as you say, was passed on a great deal. His wife, there, um, Herman Bush, the cellist and conductor, who was also part of Bush's string quartet, which played here very early on. Just some quick images of Serkin, the animating spirit, they say, of, of Marlboro. This is um, a CD which you can buy. It's on the open market, and it has some wonderful uh, recordings from our archives that they, some, and some from other sources, but some from our archives too, which is great. <laughs> um, Moise and rehearsal. Out of doors, did you? David Sawyer, yeah. Um, the Casals, maybe um, you want to say anything about the Casals tradition at, at Marlboro? Well, unfortunately, he died just before I went, so I never had any exposure to him, but certainly the Schneiders yeah. kept his, his uh, way, of, way of doing things alive for a long, long time. And there's a long history of, of Casals doing master classes and teaching and conducting, and so that, that it, some things have evolved and gone on. And so unfortunately, Casals was a little bit back in back the there. 70s now. <laughs> and um, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, but, but true, you can still find wonderful uh, videos and stuff of, of him. They have, there's a whole collection of his master classes. And recordings, Marlboro. yeah. I think, the, were they part of the collection on Bridge? Well, I think a couple of the I, Casals, I think yeah, so. yeah. The 50th anniversary uh, release on Bridge. Um, and I remember reading a comment about Casal saying that he worked with orchestras to teach them to play the repertoire as chamber music pieces. That's interesting. Um, Mitsuko Uchida and Richard Good, the two co-directors for a while. Now uh, Mitsuko is the main director, sole director. This is a, just a fun, beautiful little illustration. It's a great article, The Music Mountain, an Alex Ross article, if you'd like to read more about Marlboro. These are, yeah, from the... Thank goodness I'm not wearing the same thing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, informal, nice things. Sam Rhodes from the Juilliard Quartet. That's another thing we could talk about a lot is how the influence of Marlboro percolates out through so many ensembles. For example, your quartet. You want to say something about the Momenta Quartet and you studied... Uh, the Kusevitsky work that you mentioned earlier? Oh, yeah. Um, well, we were emailing before um, today. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I, well, I was just thinking in my head, what is, you know, what are the connections that I, that I know of between, like, yeah, just um, Marlboro and the Kusevitsky legacy? And I mean, first of all, like, if you look down, the, if you just, like, skim the list of, you know, all of the Kusevitsky commissions that have been awarded, it's like every major name of the 20th and 21st century compositionally. Um, and some of the greatest works of our time have come out of the Kusevitsky commission. And um, yeah, my quartet, uh, Momenta Quartet, uh, we have had the great honor of having uh, two Kusevitsky commission pieces written for us. Uh, one by Kiyong Chong, who's a Malaysia-based composer, and one by Agustin Fernandez, who is a Bolivian composer based in the UK now. Um, and 
uh, yeah, I was thinking just, you know, about what are some of the other pieces, you know, that I know of chamber-wise that are Kusevitsky related, and I immediately thought of Dutia uh, Ainsi la Nuit, which is one of the cornerstones of the 20th century quartet literature. It's an amazing work, and I realized that like, my, my quartet plays it a lot now, and I realized that I got my start, and the reason I really love this piece is because I spent like six weeks working on it at Marlboro, um, like four or five years ago, and it's, yeah, well, that's an amazing piece, but um, there, there's so much amazing music that has come out, that has percolated out of you know, the Kusevitsky legacy, and a lot of these composers have been studied, these composers and these works have been studied uh, for many, many weeks uh, on end at Marlborough. So it's a nice connection. You know, one of the things that we talked about a little bit was how uh, people don't think of modern music so much at Marlboro as they think of the great masters, but I think that's really wrong. I think you guys have studied a lot, and uh, the tradition of studying these scores, I mean, is a major part of your tradition. It's, we have a composer in residence every year. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I'm, I'm often involved in, in, in those pieces, I don't know why, but I am, they make, <laughs> <laughs> um, that Kaya Sariajo has been there a couple of times, Mr. Pendereski was there, uh, Georg Wiedmann has been there, um, next year, uh, Sofia Gubaidolina is coming, which yeah. is kind of incredible, nice. she never goes anywhere, no. yeah. really, like, she literally never goes yeah. anywhere, <laughs> so it's really, like, a, I, I think, I think they're, like, going to, like, put her in a little box and preserve her and bring her over. Um, okay, she's 90-something. Or, oh, wow. Yeah, so Jeez. we hope that she is in good health for the summer. Um, yeah, so there's a huge, yeah. huge, and it's, and it's becoming more and more. We do, we do more things. Uh, Thomas Addis was there. And, and I just wanted to add, also one of my uh, best experiences at Marlboro was actually working with Sam Rhodes on a Carter clarinet quintet, which, um, I, well, I feel, of course, any of the music we work on at Marlboro warrants that sort of time, but, you know, with that piece, you literally cannot put it together in much less time than that. So it was, yeah, and also to learn it with Sam, who, who worked with him for decades uh, in the Juilliard Quartet. That's the sort of experience that yeah, I don't know where you would have anywhere else, actually. Let's see what else we... we move on from there just a second. That's a classic photograph that you see a lot, Van Cliburn and um, James Levine at age 12. <laughs> Alexander Schneider. And Casals. And Casals, look at, uh, in the back. And uh, back to quartets for a minute. Here at the library, of course, we have, uh, we are a quartet mecca, really. And so many of the quartets that have been associated with the Mar Marlboro legacy have passed through here. For example, Alexander Schneider's own quartet. He had a quartet for a number of years, and Herman Bush was part of that, actually. And of course, the Juilliard, the Emerson, and many other quartets have had one or more members uh, learn their uh, life's history and work and calling from these great artists. So let's see, a couple more. Bl Blanche Onegir Moise. Did you ever go to those? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. I'm going to say what the tradition was. Uh, she did a Bach cantata concert every summer, uh, which was, it's actually the Marlboro players didn't, didn't do them. She brought in her own orchestra, uh, mostly because we didn't have time to devote to what she wanted at the time. But the singers would all sing, and really inspirational to hear the Bach cantatas in, the, in that setting and anywhere. But she, she did it very beautifully. Rehearsal images. Yeah. That's, uh, that was Felix. And this is very nice. This is a project you did at the Green Space, WQXR in New York, a beautiful venue, um, uh, one of the touring ensembles from Marlboro. Michael, when did you start presenting the Marlboro Group? Uh, we uh, started in the fall of 1993. Uh, the uh, Meyer family uh, had a long history uh, with uh, Marlboro musicians and the festival. Uh, and the director of the museum at the time, Milo, Milo Beach, was uh, good friends with both uh, Catherine Graham and uh, Elizabeth Meyer. 
Uh, as long as we're looking at those uh, older pictures, I was going to mention that uh, uh, Elizabeth Meyer, uh, the wife of uh, Eugene Meyer, a former owner of the Washington Post, former first head of the World Bank and uh, chair of the Federal Reserve and a financier earlier, uh, she uh, uh, and, uh, and Eugene uh, Meyer uh, collected Chinese art with, uh, with Freer back in the very early 20th century. Uh, and uh, after uh, uh, Fear died, and uh, uh, years later, uh, during the war, uh, uh, Agnes Meyer, according to Frank Solomon, let's, uh, who I, was told us all about this a couple summers ago, uh, when uh, uh, Serkin and the Bushes had left Germany in the middle of the war and gone to uh, Switzerland, I think, uh, were eager to get out of Europe and uh, uh, Agnes Meyer uh, went uh, personally to the State Department to uh, lobby for getting their visas uh, put through, and that's uh, how they finally got to the U.S. Uh, permanently during the war. Uh, and then their uh, son, one of their sons, uh, Bill Meyer, uh, be, uh, came up, uh, and his wife became supporters of uh, Marlboro and went regularly. So uh, when the uh, Meyer Auditorium reopened in 1993, uh, after renovation with funds from Catherine Graham and the Meyer family, it was renamed the Eugene and Agnes Meyer Auditorium. And uh, the grandchildren of Eugene and Agnes uh, helped start the Meyer Concert Series on the provision that it regularly include the musicians from Marlboro uh, every year. And we, uh, Milo Beach of Time had no trouble agreeing to that. And so we've had Marlboro there every year for the uh, last 20 some years. And then it's a wonderful segue from us, and this is part of the history that Michael and I talked about when we first had this idea to share the project for your anniversary year, uh, and our anniversary too, was that we began presenting Marlboro in 1980 with uh, great pleasure for something we called the Saturday Series, and then when with, uh, I think the first performers were Hiroko, Yajima, and Andra Schiff, um, among others. Yeah. Gary Hoffman, exactly. <laughs> Boy, you have a memory, a great memory. And then we had to shut down our operation, as many of you in the audience remember because we had the whole building renovated so there was an eight year nine eight and a half nine year period when we could do no concerts and thankfully you were able to to take it on um, let's see let's end this part oh that's a nice one <laughs> we'll end, see if we can get out of this Wuhan yeah, Wuhan and Isidore Cohen, one of my favorite people. I got a kick out of reading in, in your red book that it said Mr. Cohen would look at the musicians very carefully and he'd say, well, what do you think? Should there be a decrescendo here? <laughs> okay, so in, in bad, and we'll escape and we'll minimize. This is the, it, it's so sweet that it says the first appearance in America, but it's just very, very heartening to see this. Um, and one thing that's interesting, back to our ideas about modern music, um, Mr. Bush insisted that there be some hot off the press music. So for example, he included uh, Max Rager, and then also in another program, he had a brand new Pizzetti piece, which was literally, literally hot off the press. It was 1933, and the concert date was 1933. And in the letters back and forth to um, our priests, our managers, he stressed that he wanted to have a modern music element, which is really interesting to see. Um, what other things about the current experience that that would you guys like to talk about? And then we can move also into the music for tonight, too. What are, are there new projects for Marlboro? Like this whole thing at QXR was kind of fascinating to see that happen. I was there. <laughs> Were you there? Yeah. The, the, um, well, actually, what that concert is when this year is the 50th anniversary of the touring program, mm. 65th anniversary of the festival and the 50th anniversary of the touring program. And so it was celebrating the touring program that we did a, a nice concert there it was broadcast and so just getting generating some some hoopla among the celebration so that's basically what it's what it was for and we anthony played and i played with jonathan biss um we did and robin scott we did a mendelssohn trio 
And so it was a, it was a wonderful event. It has almost every event that we do for Marlboro is wonderful. This is wonderful. We played, at, we played at Carnegie Hall on Monday night. That was wonderful. We played in a funny little library on Sunday in Greenwich, Connecticut, but that was wonderful too. <laughs> And we have all your archives here, or at least um, in many decades worth. We don't have the recent ones, so we need to get those. Any, is there any chance of you guys moving to MP3s uh, to distribute, distribute now? Or what's your current think, thinking about your recording uh, projects? Online distribution of any kind? No? I, I'm sure that that's its whole dedicated department. It at really Marlboro. is. Like yeah. they have a team of you know audio engineers and, and archivists, and they probably have a lot of that in the works. They're probably thinking ahead, but but, but we don't know that, personally. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't Paolo Safiati part of that uh, in for a long time, and then Misha Schneider? Misha Schneider was the sort of head of the Marlboro Recording Society, um, and so recordings that were made. There hasn't been as many. Um, in studio recordings done in the last years, um, and I, I, don't, I hope we'll get back to that. I don't know what's going on with that, but we used to make recordings of some of the pieces that we would perform in the summer, and Misha was the was the producer, so he well, did that, and I think Paula the, I think funded it. The audience here might be interested in knowing that the Marlboro did launch a, a pretty ambitious uh, online recording. Uh, resource, and you can hear a lot of historic recordings from Marlboro, and it's completely indexed by performer uh, and composer, and you can uh, it's and it's always being added to uh, every year. In fact, uh, on their um, website, or yeah, mm -hmm. and Paolo, you could listen to recordings. I don't know what re which recordings are. I believe they're from the festival, uh, but. Uh, uh, Paola Safiati's daughter, uh, uh, who's on the local uh, board of Marlboro, uh, was very uh, proud of this and uh, informed me of it. And uh, so I, she asked me to announce it before a concert of Marlboro's just a couple of years ago. So it's uh, and it's always growing, and uh, they're very happy about it. But before we move to the uh, talking more about the music, anybody want to comment about napkin throwing? That's something you read about, but you are the experts. I mean, I remember um, the first, uh, like after my first summer there, like it was like definitely a good month after, it was like late September. And I found myself at a restaurant, like, you know, with, in public. And I had taken my napkin and just instinctively was starting to create a napkin ball, like under the table. And then I realized this is not the place. I'm not at Marlboro. <laughs> That's the only comment I have. <laughs> There's it's a time-honored tradition. All all ages, yeah. all all backgrounds, all instruments. Apparently, you know, even Mr. Serkin. Yeah, no, it really it really does happen. I I <laughs> couldn't quite believe it before I got there, but it it does. I think there's somebody that had to be shielded with an umbrella. There's oh, well. this, this. That's a very funny story. <laughs> there's um when. When after Mr. Serkin died, the very beginning there was a there was a trio of artistic directors, and one of those artistic directors who I don't think I'll name <laughs> um, really wanted to do away with the napkin balls. It, it, it was not something that he appreciated, and he felt that he, he shouldn't have to be bombarded by this. So, a napkin-free zone was set up. <laughs> In the dining hall, it was a, It was like there was a, a row of music stands on which there were signs that said napkin-free zone, which is just really like asking people to, to, to do it. And, and we had this wonderful librarian uh, her, whose name I can mention. Her name was Shirley Weekly. She had been also a fixture, a Marlboro fixture for 40 years, and she was also the librarian at uh, Curtis. A lovely lady. She had some... She, she didn't like, she loved the, well, let's say she didn't like the napkin balls either, so she hadn't eaten in the dining room for, I don't know, 20 years that, or, or more. She always took her tray and ate in, the, in another room off the, off the dining hall. So this night, that of this inaugural napkin-free zone, Shirley Weekly came back into the dining hall thinking she was safe. And at one point, and I, and I believe I know who engineered the whole thing, and I, as it happens, the person who 
who was who was initiating this happens to be a close friend of mine. And I, so I was I was not in favor of this thing, but I, I was sitting and having dinner with with them on that side of the other side of the of the barrier. The entire other side of the room in unison got up and threw napkin balls <laughs> off the way. And Shirley Weekly never ate in the dining hall again. <laughs> and and uh, and that artistic director also didn't stay around for a very long time. That was um, unfortunate. Not I don't know if it was because of that. But <laughs> it was not a good beginning. Well, I think uh, hearing this and seeing how much fun the musicians have uh, at Marlboro helped me realize where the spirit comes from that I had seen on stage for so many years, where the, you musicians clearly and unmistakably enjoy what you're doing. I mean, even if some music is, is very serious, it's done in a certain manner that is uh, a, a real passion that, that comes across. I think it's cultivated in part by the festival atmosphere. It is uh, the farthest thing from uh, uh, workmanlike or drudgery, and I, I think it's as it may sound frivolous. This kind of games and antics and things, but uh, it definitely works. I mean, it, it makes the groups that come out of Marlboro stand out for the sheer enjoyment of of what it is you're doing. Before we um, sort of have to give you a chance to a chance to go back and warm up, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the music and maybe about the Pinderesky? Uh, Emily, you were saying. Um, you have to add some thoughts on the textures and uh, everything. Oh, well, um, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, um, you know, the music will more than speak for itself. But, um, uh, you know, the Pendereski is sort of an incredible work uh, just uh, in the kind of atmosphere that it creates um, and the, the gamut of moods that it explores. Um, as many of you may know, Penderecki, uh, his Penderecki's music figured into some of the big film scores of the past uh, few decades, such as The Shining or uh, even The Exorcist, uh, and and numerous other films he's written. Uh, he sort of made that leap into pop culture. I learned he even has an asteroid named after him, which must be like a great honor. Um, but uh, like the thing about, you know, I think. Maybe because he's so effective writing for film it, it, is that he he's so adept at creating uh, just an all-encompassing mood, uh, you know, whatever that mood might be. And the piece itself is it's quite short. It's four movements. Three of them are ataka. They they go consecutively. You can't really hear when they stop and start. Um, and. Uh, it, each movement is sort of a tip of the hat, in a way, to different composers of the past. You, you'll, you'll see in your programs, the movement titles are very evocative. There's an ironic uh, waltz, there, a serenade, um, that reminds you of something you might hear in a Webern or Schoenberg. Uh, the last movement, for instance, is, in, is entitled Abschied, which means farewell in German. That's a very strong... Uh, Beethoven, Schumann, Mahler reference built in. And so, yeah, and, and as Marcy said, it really captures some of that same sort of autumnal feeling that you get in the, at the end of the Brahms. It, they're, they're very similar, in, they're kindred spirits in many ways. So um, hopefully this will enhance your listening of, of all the pieces on the program. Wonderful, and uh, also this, you mentioned Kaya Sariaho. They, these musicians, the touring ensemble from Marlboro, will be coming back in May again with Michael as co-sponsor, and they'll be doing that work here for then for that concert. Any questions for the musicians and Michael? Roger. Yes, uh, the publicity mentioned that uh, Pendereski was influenced was. Uh, that there's a relationship to the Schubert uh, C major quintet, and uh, that's one of my favorite things, so I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about that. Yeah, I looked that up. Um, I, I think it was more, again, with this sort of idea of 
uh, paying homage to Vienna in some way. I don't think that it's, it's not actually explicitly referencing it in any way, except for maybe that like some of the moods uh, that it creates that are so untouchable sometimes. Uh, I, I sense some of the same uh, depth in, in both the pieces, but I, I think it's more abstract, you know, on an ab abstract level that it uh, pays homage to, to that piece. Anybody else? About, let's see, if, oh, and while we're just thinking one, maybe one more question. Any comments on the Brahms that you're for tonight? This is kind of a great, great classic work. Have you done this before? In uh, well, I have, but it's, I mean, I think we all feel the same. It's just a great honor to get to play such a piece six times in a row um, and to work on it. Um, there really is no other piece like it or quite with that depth of feeling or special place in his life and also what it expresses. So we're enjoying it. I'm curious about cross-fertilization between seniors who may be wind players, vocalists, string players. To what extent do they extend their, their um, nuances to, to other groups of players? That is, would a, would a woodwind player, a flutist, a singer coach a string group uh, no. on some occasion? <laughs> Never. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yeah. No, um, but we would coach them. <laughs> no, that's, I'm totally um, <laughs> getting silly because we have a concert. And, uh, <laughs> um, um, no, but what, certainly uh, Marcel Moitz was a great influence on a lot of people at Marlboro, and um, Charlie Nydick is a, is a current influence on lots of people in both because of his character and because he's a really interesting and very intelligent musician that has, he has a whole well of knowledge that you just are shocked by all the time. And, um, you know, it's, we, Benita Valente is there as a, as a singer for, as a, a coach for the singers, but if you're working with the singer in a chamber music work, she's at your rehearsals, so she does have some cross-fertilization in terms of working on Schoenberg second quartet, for instance, that has soprano in it. Um, or last summer we did a Caesariajo piece with, for a soprano. It's like basically a concerto for soprano and cello, and uh, it actually has, does have an orchestra part, but she wrote a piano version of it, so we did it as a trio. But so Benita was there listening to all of those rehearsals as well, and it was a, certainly very helpful. To, to have her there. So there is definitely, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, segregate. We're even, we even talk to singers all through, during, <laughs> all during the summer. We, we consider them as normal people. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that might be a good note to end on. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very, very much to the music. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.